but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first announcement, question 27, because it's going to be relevant. A lot of people will get question 27 marked wrong. There was a big typo in the key. Uh, if you said, crap, what was the answer, B? If you said B, it actually was marked correctly. If you're nervous that it wasn't actually accounted for in your score, all you have to do is take a look at the little red number at the bottom of your Scantron, times two. Does that match the Scantron score in your exam? If it matches, then it, I may not have actually accounted for 27 correctly. Okay? Most people should see their Scantron score higher than the, uh, on the exam than if they just multiply the raw number off the Scantron. Right. If you have questions about, at all about that, that's fine. Just come and ask me because it is possible that there was a mistake made where I didn't catch it. But I'm pretty sure I've caught all of those kind of typo errors. Okay. So question 27 is answer B. As far as the exam goes, uh, the average was 58. Notice that's not a percent. That's points because it wasn't out of 100. It was out of uh, like 110, something like that. All of your exams will total to more than 100 points. Those extra points are there as just kind of fluff points. Not really fluff, but uh, sort of an opportunity for extra credit. Right? <laughs> or an opportunity to just be like, I just didn't study that content. So you can lose a couple points without it directly affecting your grade. The other thing I'm going to try to start including every time I put up an exam histogram like this is the standard deviation. So a lot of students aren't aware of what goes on with exams and freak out when it's anything lower than, say, most people even freak out if it's lower than 80%. But 75 is usually what your average is supposed to be, right? allegedly, which is wrong. That's not true. Your average is supposed to be a 50%. Right? That's where an average is supposed to be. That gives everybody the equal opportunity to prove or the opportunity to distinguish themselves from everybody else. Okay? That's what an average of a 50% does. Anything higher than that, students that really know the knowledge don't get to differentiate themselves from students that didn't know it. Okay? That's why the average should come in at a 50%. This means when we go through and calculate grades, that causes all sorts of anxiety. And there's not a lot I can do about that except to tell you that that anxiety is false. Okay? What you should be doing is taking the average and the standard deviation. Okay. As a rough approximation, the average plus the standard deviation is right about at the BA borderline. So a 68 on this exam is roughly an A, okay? hanging by the thread of your teeth kind of an A. If you're higher than that, that's probably an A. The same goes for the other direction. If I take 58 minus 10 and go to a 48, you're now on the DF border, okay? Not a happy place to be. I don't want you to be there and we wanna fix that, okay? So the reason I show the histogram is to get an idea of what happens and what you end up seeing and how grades can potentially get assigned. If I go through and look at this, what I do see is an approximate bell curve, which isn't too bad. It kinda of levels off out the end, okay? And arguably it actually has a blip upwards there. So that doesn't look horrible. Uh, the issue that I've got is it looks to me like it's weighted more heavily towards the lower end, and I don't like that. Okay, so we need to fix that. Okay. OCHEM is hard. There's lots of content that's going to be an issue. Okay. As we continue through the semester, guess what's going to happen with all of the content you just got tested on? Yeah. You're going to get tested on it again. Okay. And not just what is the hybridization, but now this molecule reacts. Why does this molecule react? Because of the hybridization. Okay, so you get layers upon layers when we move through. Okay, this means that in theory, by the end of the semester, you'll go back, look at exam one, and be like, this was easy. How did I get that question wrong? Okay, or at very least, most of these questions were easier. I don't know why I got those wrong. Okay, so don't stress entirely yet. A lot of people want to get an idea of a grade, and I can understand that. Right? However, it is a horrible idea to assign a grade for this exam. Why? We try it by show of hands. How many people want their letter grade assigned on this one exam? 
Okay, no, so there's a very good reason. You don't want a letter grade assigned on this single exam. Why not? Because it's a crappy grade. You, we're just starting. Was this all you did? Was just this one exam and prep for this class? That was it? You just took the exam and that was it? No. No, what else did you do? Homework. Homework. Okay. You did quizzes. You watched videos. Okay. You did a lot of prep work in trying to improve your grade and understand. You get credit for that. Okay. That needs to get factored in. So do not assign yourself a letter grade on a single data point. That is an awful idea. Right. Some people were sick that day. That really sucks to have your entire letter grade dependent on a day where you showed up unhealthy. Okay. So we account for that as best as we can. So don't go jumping to conclusions right away. Another big reason why you don't want to directly assign a letter grade here. Okay. Let's take into consideration that we have the rest of the semester, and yes, that could potentially improve your grade. We also have an extra little piece with the final. What is that piece with the final? We have a resurrection final. Learn the content. Do better on the final. That final exam score will replace this if this is your lowest exam. This score could have zero impact on your overall grade. Okay? So learn from it. Find out where things went wrong. And if where those things went wrong were my fault, let me know so I can adjust. If you don't tell me, I can't fix. Okay? Kind of make sense? Okay. When exams start to flutter in the 50 range, I start to panic a little bit because that means I have to do a significant curve at the end of the semester. It also means that students may not have picked up the content as well as I want them to. Okay? So what I tend to do is offer the opportunity for extra points. Okay, even though colleagues have told me not to, but I do. Okay. Exam one, you can get more points. This is not an extra credit assignment. Because the class is graded on a curve, these points go into the grade, which means if you do not do this assignment and everybody else does, the average for the exam goes up while yours stays static. Okay. That becomes problematic as far as the letter grade goes. So this is not an extra credit assignment. Okay. It is also not an easy thing to do to get these points back. Okay. For every multiple choice answer that you got wrong, explain why the wrong answers are wrong. This doesn't mean, well, I said the answer was B and the answer was A, so that's why I'm wrong. No, that's not an explanation. Okay. The explanation goes through for every multiple choice question that you got wrong, there are three wrong answers. Tell me why each of those three wrong answers are wrong. That's a lot of work, and it requires you thinking very critically about the question and the answers provided. This can help you go through and do better on future exams because it can improve your test-taking ability because you can start to think through and reason why answers were wrong. I guess C, but there's no way I should have guessed C because it said goats, and the question was talking about apples. Okay? And apples the computer, not apples the fruit. So there's no connection between goats and apples. Okay? Why did I do that? If you can start to go through and find those mistakes, you can fix those mistakes in the future. Okay? If you satisfactorily complete all of those aspects, then I will give you a maximum of half of your total missed points on the exam. Not on the multiple choice, on the entire exam. Okay? Which, yes, you can complain to me later about that if you want. Okay? But that's what I'm doing. Okay, this will be due March 9th by 5 p.m. Okay. So as you're going, well, that's lots of time. What is also due that same week? <laughs> Exam two. And for those of you in lab, the spectroscopy packet. There's a lot of stuff due that week that you still have to process. We've got a lot of stuff to go through. You should be working on this step by step. Okay. The other part behind this is it's only for the ones that you got wrong. You did better on the exam. I don't think you should have to do as much work because you did better on the exam. Uh, you still get access to the same potential point boon, okay? um, but you won't have to do as much work. I fully expect you to work together, talk to people, okay? talk to me. I have no problems helping you with it, okay? particularly because I'm going to bet most people have never had to go through and do this to an exam. Uh, actually, there's probably two people that have. 
right? And those two or three people probably had me as an instructor in the past. Okay. So how do we go through and do this? Well, I picked a question as an example. Question five, which of the following orbitals cannot be used to make a sigma bond according to hybridization theory? So number one, most people got this question right, which is actually why I picked it. Okay. There's about three or four of you that I think got it wrong. Guess what? Here's an answer. Here's an answer. Lucky you. Okay. The next thing I would address on this is that when I look at most of your exams with this question, here's what I see. Yeah, everything in the red box is what I see on your exam. What do you mean? What are we looking at? Exactly. We're looking at absolutely nothing. You wrote absolutely nothing down, which means you tried to solve that entire question in your head. Okay. That's good if your brain is good. And I apologize, it's going to sound like a bit of a, a wank move, but we're going to do it. <laughs> Don't work in your head. Write it down. Yes, that takes time, but that improves your score. Okay? So, as I read through this question, okay, which the following orbitals cannot, okay, that's a bit irritating. We have a not. Negatives are always fun. I usually do try to highlight those and draw attention to them. This time I missed it. Cannot be used to make, sig make a sigma bond according to hybridization theory. Okay? So my work would be not sigma. Well, what is not sigma asking for? It's a pi bond. Okay, so what I'm asking in this question is actually which of these make a pi bond? Okay. Now I have an easier way to approach this question. Okay. The next part that you should be writing for your work or for this assignment is now addressing what is sigma and what is pi. Sigma bonds are made with S-type orbitals. Pi bonds are made with P-type orbitals. Since A through C all have S orbitals present, they are all wrong. You've addressed all of that information. Right? Typically what I would get for a response from students would be this. A through C all have S orbitals, so they're wrong. That's not an explanation. There's a lot of factual information behind that statement that needs to get written out. This is an intentional assignment. Think about each of those stages along the way. Kind of make sense? Okay. Does this count as paper homework? No, this is not paper homework. Okay. Okay. Admittedly, I don't check the paper homework all that carefully. <laughs> um, but no, it should not be counted as paper homework. The next part behind this is if we now jump to the class grade. Same deal, histogram of the scatter plot or whatever you want to call it of everybody's grade. The class average is a 68%. Remember exam one, the average was a 58%. Now we're at a 68%. Oh my God, it's a 10% improvement in grade. Why on, why on earth would that ever happen? What is your average homework grade? 100%. Pretty darn close to 100%. Okay. When you factor in both of those pieces of information, of course, the class grade goes up. Okay? Same kind of deal applies. 68 is then by default a C. Okay? If you're trying to figure out your letter grade and where you're performing, okay? the standard deviation came in again about 10 points. So 10 percentage points under 68 would be a 58. That's hovering on the D, F border. Okay? 10 percentage points higher than 68 would be your AB border. Okay? So you can go through and take a look at what Canvas spits out as your total percentage, and you can use that rough approximation to determine your letter grade. Okay? You're right at 68, that's a C. 69 is not significantly above a 68, that's still a C. Okay? The exact lines usually fall out later in the semester. Things that will happen as the semester goes is we'll see gaps like this increase. Right? That's usually a good place to drop a grade break. Because if I drop a grade break right here, right? so let's say 
I drop a grade break in blue versus red. Okay, well, on the red grade break, I'm going to have one student complaining to me, maybe two. The blue one, I'm going to get a third of the class coming and complaining about grades. Can you just round one more point? Okay. I can minimize that by picking spots for grade breaks where there aren't any students. Okay. So I use that to help inform that decision. Okay. And usually what happens is I slide the cutoff down lower to try and minimize those issues. Okay, kind of makes sense? Kind of. You sort of had a hand? No. No? No, I was like rooting for my grade. <coughs> okay, so again, I want to address or stress here that this is not your final grade in the class. Okay. Take lessons from the exam forward to improve on future exams. Okay. That's what you need to focus on. Okay. And then remember also, the final will replace your lowest exam grade. So as long as you can figure out what went wrong and fix it, you should be fine. Okay. <coughs> Which Excuse me. sets us up for the next kind of unit. The next unit is a little bit different. We'll have a little bit of carryover from Chapter 5. Okay. But this next unit gives us kind of a temporary break from all that structure stuff. The first unit was what is a structure? How do we draw it? How do we place it? Where do electrons move? How does that allow us to identify the relationships between different structures? Okay. This next unit says, I'm in lab. How do I know that clear solution is water and not poison? What can I do to determine that? That is spectroscopy, short of drinking it, because that's generally a bad idea. Okay. So that's our spectroscopy. So what we've got up on this first slide is pretty much all of the spectroscopy stuff that you should absolutely memorize. Uh, and that said, that IR table is a bit excessive. Okay. But this stuff should be relatively close to the back of your hand when you go through to start an exam or any question on spectroscopy. Because this gets you quick, easy answers that you can eliminate structures with that allows you to move forward with the content. Okay? So we've got the IR table. I'm just going to go over the top of it. We've got our mass spec stuff in the lower left. And then we have HNMR and CNMR. Okay? I told you to all watch the spectroscopy videos. There were two glorious hours. I think actually if you account for rounding on that, it's probably closer to two and a half glorious hours of video to go through and do this. I've had several students come up and be like, I thought I needed to do more to prepare for these videos because I watched the video and was like, I feel like I'm missing something. Okay? You're not alone. Okay? Spectroscopy takes time and practice to look at spectra and manipulate those structures. Start now. In fact, start now. Almost. Sorry. Forget I said that. There's a file on Canvas called spect.org. Okay, what it is is how I organize how I would go through and solve a spectroscopy problem. If you look, it fills up an entire sheet because okay, it has all the forms of spectroscopy and it ultimately ends with a final structure. On your next exam, you will be expected to do this once. Okay, so I will give you the spectra and then just say, go, tell me what the answer is. And you have to come to that conclusion. That is difficult. That's why I only give you one. Okay? You want practice doing this? There's the spectroscopy problems set. Okay? And I believe that's posted for the lecture as well as the lab. If you're in lab, you're doing that anyway. Okay? You have to pick five of those. Okay? Everybody else, it's just there as practice. This organizes the thought process all the way through. Notice it starts with IR. Why would I start with IR? Because it's quick and it's easy. Then it moves to mass spec. Mass spec in its own right is its own class. And yet, I only have a tiny little section on it. That's because for what we need, it's a tiny little section. We don't need to go into a whole lot of detail. Then we have carbon NMR. Again, tiny little section. Because the information we can get out of it is relatively limited. 
and then HNMR, which is this massive table that takes up three quarters of the page. Right? That's because HNMR has the most information in it. It is also the most difficult to process. So if you're given all, don't start with the HNMR. Start with the other stuff. Get the easy parts done first, then level up. Okay? And now if I remember right, I said practice is important. I will give you... I already talked too long. I will give you 30 seconds. Tell me what you see. Wait, never mind. Who's coming through the door? OK, now 30 seconds, <laughs> starting now. What do you see in that IR? If you see nothing, that's fine. Write it down. All right. What do you see? That would be time. You're like, really? That was fast. Yes, it was. Here's what should have happened. Mm. Done. Another 30 seconds. Nope. Another 30 seconds. So in fairness, I kind of screwed up with the last one. I should have done 30 seconds. So there's my 30 seconds. Oh, God, my long division. Oh, I'm going to fail at this one horribly. Uh, eight. It's seven. Oh, yeah. yeah, god damn it. So there went my pass. <laughs> so all I got out of this was that 93. Unfortunately, I actually missed a couple obvious ones, um, which we'll deal with later. Why was that, why was that the M plus? Was there a free we'll talk about it when we get to mass spec. 30 seconds, CNMR. You all, in theory, watched the video, so you should be able to get some kind of content down. And it's okay if you get nothing. But at least acknowledge that you got nothing. Write it down. Admittedly, I don't know when we actually started timing on that one. Sorry. <laughs> so 30 seconds, one, two, three. That was actually only 10 seconds. So all I expect to get out of it? Yes, that's it. Next, 30 seconds. seconds on this one. There was our 30 seconds. No! Go! Yeah. Can I restart? Damn it. one gets a bit challenging. That's about all I can nail down in 30 seconds. 
Okay. Not a lot of content, but each of those little scribbles in only 30 seconds gets me pieces of information that I could now whittle away at a multiple choice answer. Right. Should you be going that fast? Yes. Yes. Right. Are you there yet? No, you haven't practiced. Okay. And a lot of this uh, gets overanalyzed, and that's one of the things we have to be careful on. So when we go through and look at spectroscopy, you should be thinking as fast as you can, get some information down, move on. Okay? Because it will take time to process. Get as much of the correct stuff down as you can, and then just advance. Okay? So, any last second questions before we double back? Yippee. That's exciting, isn't it? Remember how we had to classify molecules and we had to look at an antimers to diastereomers? Yay. So unfortunately, this is carryover. I apologize. I didn't talk fast enough in the first unit. I'll try and talk faster this unit. I was kind of joking. Okay. We have to be able to compare two structures and decide their relationships. That's the big thing out of Chapter 5. Right, and this is going to become important because we'll run reactions that could pr possibly produce multiple diff different results. We have to know the relationship between those results because that might mean two answers are valid. Right? That might mean only one answer is valid. Right? So we have to be able to evaluate these relationships. Right? So one thing to do would be look at a structure and identify chiral atoms. So in those three examples... Right. Identify if the molecule can be chiral by marking all stereocenters. Right. And then determine how many stereoisomers are possible. This is review. First one. What do you think? Chiral, A, chiral. It's chiral. Right. One of the things that we can do to find if it's chiral or not. not by marking all the stereocenters. Right. To mark the stereocenter, we need to find a carbon with four different things attached. Carbon versus hydrogen, are those different? Yes. Yeah. Is a CH2 different from a CH3? Yes. Is a CH that is sp2 hybridized different from the other Cs? Yes. That carbon is chiral. That car carbon being chiral and that being the only chiral atom in that structure means that that molecule is indeed chiral. Next one. Because right, if we learn our lessons from the first one, it shows wedges and dashes, which means when I move to the second one, you gave me a wedge, dude. That was way too easy. That's got to be chiral. No. No. no, why not? That CH2 is indistinguishable from that CH2. If I can't tell a difference, I'd moved the next atom away. That would be another CH2 versus CH2. Again, indistinguishable. I then continue to move through, and I now overlap, which means the CH2s were never distinguishable between each other. There's only three groups around that one. That one is actually achiral. The last one. Well, there's no wedges and dashes, so... Must be achiral. Right? No, we have chiral centers here, here, and here. Okay. Those red dots did not show up as big as they did on my screen, perhaps because I could zoom in. Those are three chiral atoms. The molecule will be chiral. Okay, kind of makes sense? If we look at the bottom two examples that were drawn in. The left one is known as a spiro compound. And then the middle one is cumuline. Don't stress necessarily about those names, but you might see them pop up. Okay. Do you see a carbon with four different things attached? Either of those structures, no. Okay. So our gut reflex is going to be to call those molecules a chiral. Okay. But we have to be very careful with that. Our definition of chiral means non-superimposable on the mirror image. If I take a look at the cumuline, because I think I drew this one right, you can check me here, and I draw its mirror image. So I put a mirror plane there. 
and I draw the result. That should be shown in purple. Everybody agree? What happens if I take that purple structure and now flip it over? Okay. The bromine that's solid, right, should overlap with the solid. So most of the structure overlaps except the wedged and dashed bromine hydrogens don't overlap, meaning these two structures are non-superimposable, meaning they are enantiomers, meaning it's a chiral molecule. Okay, so we can have <laughs> molecules that are chiral without chiral atoms. Okay? That is insanely tricky, but it can happen. Okay, so the cumulene is a relatively easy one to deal with. The spiral compound, not so easy because, number one, Mike drew it horribly. That's a tetrahedral carbon. We have a wedge and a dash. Okay. And I, I may have also drawn it wrong, by the way, for the record. Okay. Um, if we took its mirror image and tried to draw and then superimpose, okay, depending on if I drew it right or not. If I drew it right, it wouldn't superimpose. Okay. If I drew it wrong, um, it would superimpose. So just exchanging where that oxygen is can make it from chiral to achiral. Just like over here, exchanging that bromine from being dash to wedge can make it chiral to achiral. Okay? So we have to be careful when we go through and look at chirality. Okay? Our ultimate definition is non-superimposable on the mirror image. Our shortcut is does it have four distinguishable groups? Most of the questions you encounter center on the four distinguishable groups, but not all. Okay? So, we've now been able to sort of at least attempt, <coughs> pretend to identify that we see two different relationships or two different structures, right, that they are chiral. We now have to come up with a way to name them. So, if I take a look at the thalidomide on the left, okay, one of those is an anti-nausea drug. The other one is a teratogen. Teratogen is fancy for saying mutations and birth defects. Okay? So, that's problematic. The structures on the right okay, are also non-superimposable. Why are those non-superimposable? Because of the pi bond. The pi bonds can't rotate. For those of you wondering, I believe it is short answer C. Think about pi bonds. Okay? So we want to be able to go through and differentiate so we can identify these structures and distinguish them as different. Okay? The way we do that is using what's known as the Kahn Ingold prelog rules, which I only learned once I started teaching here. And by only learned, I mean I knew the rules, I didn't know that it was called Kahn Ingold, just so you know. Okay. So if I go through to name the ones on the right, because I don't want to attempt to name the other one, okay, we would look at it and we got four carbons, right? So what would our root name be? Butte. They both have four carbons, so it's butte. Okay. What is the hybridization of the carbons through the backbone? Are they all sp3, or do we have a difference? We have some sp2s. Because we have some sp2s, we'll change the ending of our name to account for that new functional group. That's the alkene. So instead of calling it a butane, we'll call it a butene. The ene is a functional group. I now have to specify where the but or where the ene showed up in the chain. Where did it show up? Position two. Either way we count it, I picked a nice one for this. Either way we count it, we'd have position two. And we could call this two butene. Officially, according to IUPAC, this is now wrong. Okay? Because what is the two next to? But. So we're now saying that at position two, I have a but substitu well, it's not a substituent. That's the main chain. Okay? So there's some ambiguity theoretically in this name. Officially, it should get named but two ene. Why might we have said red was better than purple? What would the two apply to if it can't apply to the main chain? The ene. So two butene gets me the name, right? 
Why would I not draw the purple one? Because the two very clearly refers to the yin. Really? No, no ideas. Why would we have, in the past, said the red name was better than the purple? What's that? I would argue there's a different reason behind it than just numbers going first. Makes it hard to read. Why? How many of you have looked at the name of something and there's a number in the middle of the name? Okay. You're like, oh, that's funny. No one ever does that. Well, thank you, organic chemists. Okay. The purple name is the more correct one. It follows more of our nomenclature rules. It's more consistent and it's more appropriate. It doesn't mean we have to like it, but that's how it's supposed to get numbered, named. Okay. You will see both pop up in and out because the variation or the shift to the purple nomenclature as the accepted nomenclature is fairly recent, within the last probably five years. Okay. So anybody that thought it was stupid to do the shift is probably not updating their textbooks right, and is hoping that somebody comes along and later says that, no, the other one's acceptable. Okay. So what is then the difference between the names for those two compounds? We could go through and say cis and trans. Cis and trans is not nomenclature. Cis and trans just says any two groups, where are those two groups relative to each other? And when we go through and say cis but 2 ene we're now making the implication that the methyl groups are opposite each other. Why are we making the implication that it's the methyl groups? Because the other positions are hydrogens. What if they aren't hydrogens? Then the cis name becomes ambiguous. Right? So cis and trans is officially a bad nomenclature system. Officially, it's not nomenclature. It's just a way to explain the relationship between two groups. That's it. Okay? What we'll use instead of cis and trans is... I started to give out hints when I said what cis was, right? Earlier in the semester, and everybody kind of laughed. And I was like, it'll become relevant later. Easy. On the same side, cis is Z, trans is E. e. And what's RNS? Chiral centers. Right? So we have to be able to go through and look at these and say which one is which. The E and Z, relatively easy because we can see they're on the same side or they're on opposite sides. Most people can nail those down with simple structures. When we make them more advanced, it becomes more tricky. So how can we go through and do it? This is a list of all the rules. Okay? Hopefully. I right? got it nailed down here. Okay. So our alkenes, we have trans, which is E, cis becomes Z. Chiral is R and S. Some other things that might pop up with chiral molecules. You may see plus minus. You may see lowercase d, lowercase l. And you may see capital D, capital L. So four different ways to label a chiral atom. And officially, let's just say a chiral molecule. Of those four different ways, how are they related? Rhymes with thought. I know it's not, it doesn't make sense, but it's okay. They are not related. All four systems use entirely different reasons behind why they came up with the labeling system. Do not cross-communicate between them. You want to go Ghostbusters? Don't cross the streams. Okay? Or we'll go back to the urinal example. Right? <laughs> Uh, just let it go. <clears throat> so that's our system that we need to deal with. So first off, identify your structures, either an alkene or a chiral carbon. And in particular with the alkene, it can help if you recognize that it has cis-trans isomerism. Okay? It can, but not required. If you find an alkene, you should be doing this anyway. Okay? Once you've found it, then go through and assign priority to each substituent based on atomic mass. Okay. So if I go through, and let's change that little structure up top, where it says a 2, let's erase that 2. What is the atomic mass that I'm going to be looking at for position 3, or what was position 2? Okay. 
Okay, so there's my black carbon. What is the atomic mass for this piece? Are people having trouble calculating or just don't know how to answer the question? Okay. To the yes, which part of that? You want to say plus? You say you, you want to add some stuff, right? right? Yeah. But if we add stuff, is it an atomic mass? No. No, then what would it be? A molecular. Okay. This says atomic. The answer is. 12. Really? But carbon plus carbon plus 5 hydrogen is 12. I know. But a single carbon is. It is literally the atom that is directly attached. That is where I start my comparison. I do not care what else is connected to that atom yet. Right? But I will start with the atom immediately <coughs> attached. It's atomic mass. Right? And I will go through and assign priorities. One being the highest, four being the lowest. Do you want one to be the lowest and four the highest? I don't care as long as you're consistent. This is the standard. One is highest priority, four is lowest. Okay. The higher the atomic mass, the higher priority. What if you can't tell a difference? We came across several examples where it was carbon versus carbon. Well, they have the same atomic mass. Move to the next atom and repeat the question. Okay. Which has the higher atomic mass? Still no difference? Continue through the rest of the structure. If you've got to check 20 different atoms to find that difference, then you check 20 different atoms. Okay? Don't find a difference, then it's not chiral. Okay? If you still have questions, because maybe you encounter something weird, like a multiple bond. Multiple bonds are nasty confusing, because what we will do is treat each pi bond as a new sigma bond. So you end up adding ghost atoms into your structure. Yes, we'll look at this in a second. Okay. If it is an alkene, it's a little bit easier. All I have to do is star the highest priority atom on each side of the double bond, each carbon of the double bond. Okay. If my two stars are on the same side, they're Z. If they're on opposite sides, they're E. Okay. So relatively straightforward with the alkenes. The chiral atom, that one's a bit nasty. The chiral atom, I have to orient the molecule that I'm looking at. I have to change my view on it such that 4, the lowest priority, is aimed away from me. Once that is done, I can now draw an arc connecting 1 to 2 to 3 and decide which direction I'm going with that arc. Either clockwise, then it's R. Counterclockwise, it's S. Oh my god, really? Do I have to do that? Can I just look at it? Okay, well here's the issue. We're talking about the way my hand is moving, right? Which way is my hand moving? Counterclockwise. Sorry, this is really hard. Which way is my hand moving? Clockwise. Did I change the direction of my hand? No. But if I change the viewpoint on my hand, it changes the assignment. This is why you must have the lowest priority aimed away from you. Okay? That is the reasoning have to. Okay. The internet has all sorts of little shortcuts. I can show you one shortcut and about after that I've lost the internet because the whatever method the internet is using has never been consistent for me. Okay. And this is one of the problems with this. In a question where you are asked to assign RNS, you are right 50% of the time with a guess. Right? So you will go through and do crap tons of work and be like, oh, the internet said I do this, so I do this, and oh my god, I'm right. That doesn't mean what you did was right. That means you flipped a quarter and you happened to land on heads. Okay? That is the issue I have with any other method I've seen. If you can come up with a better method that allows for that assignment correctly every single time, by all means, go ahead and use it. You can even try and explain it to me. It will probably go over the top of my head just because I'm that dense. Okay? So this is how we have to go through and deal with those. Okay. For those of you who want some prettier pictures, for the chiral one, I went through and set it up so that we could see the chiral ones a little bit better. Um, it just didn't include the alkene on it. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at our alkene, alkyne nomenclature. 
Some of these are going to be required in looking at cis and trans. Some will not. Okay. Do you guys want to take a swing at them on your own first? No. <laughs> Heard a 50-50, yes and no. So let's do this. <clears throat> on your own, the top two. Together, we'll do the bottom two. Or we can race to do the top two. It's not really fair, but... I'll try and show more work than you would. So evil. Sorry. Oops. Anybody beat me yet? Just checking. Questions about the names that are shown up there? I'm wrong. Fudge. God damn it. Okay. Sorry. I'll keep working. Uh, actually, that's a lie because I have to erase a bunch of stuff. So keep working. Questions about what's shown up there for those two? Or are you good with that? I know. It's a bit crammed in there. I can say it out. The first one is 5-chloropent-1-ine. Why is the triple bond over the chloro? Well, yeah, it's because alkynes have higher priority than, than chloros or than halogens. Okay? So the, the ine will definitely take precedence. That means the chloro gets position five. With that one, or with most triple bonds, students tend to mess that up and lose a carbon because they forget carbon number two, okay. almost invariably, okay. or carbon number one. You miss one of them. I don't know which one, but you miss one. Okay. So watch out for that. The reason why you miss it is because it's a linear structure, and it's very easy to lose track of that. So watch out for it. Okay. Questions on that first one? Everyone's like, that's safe. All right, how about the second one? We've got three chloro, two, one methyl ethyl, bute, two ene, one all. Really? Do I have to do it that way? Yes. Because some stupid jerk that's actually probably very intelligent said that we should. Okay. <clears throat> I started with the bute, four carbons. Is there a longer carbon chain? Can I erase my work? Yeah? Well, let me erase all that work to clean this up. Because we said four carbon chain was the longest. One, two, three, 
four, five. Isn't five longer than four? Why is it four? Your longest carbon chain must contain the highest priority functional group, in this case being the alcohol. If we go through and look at the numbering that I've got listed here, it skips the alcohol. It labels the alcohol as a substituent. I'm not allowed to do that. Okay? So the alcohol has to be included in that. That's why I end up with four, because we go one, two, three, four. Why did I not go three, four in purple? The 3, 4 in purple doesn't include the double bond. An alkene is higher in priority than an alkane. I need to include the alkene in the main chain. Layers upon layers. Okay? And you can add whatever noun you want after that. Okay? The OH is an alcohol. Since that is my highest priority functional group, I will... Oh, man, I doubly screwed up. Sorry. Um, that needs the ending of OL. I should specify its location at position one. Within that main chain, am I all sp3 hybridized? Nope, I have an alkene. So I need to specify I have the alkene with the ene introduction. Where is the alkene located at? It starts at position two, and it moves to three. So it is two ene, one all. So I get but two ene, one all. Then I would go through and identify the substituents, which is what I attempted to do and failed there's one, there's two, there's three. Okay. I missed that third one. This should not be three chloro. This should be three, four to identify the location of each of those chlorines and dichloro. As far as the green substituent being methyl ethyl, you could also call that isopropyl. How would you know it was isopropyl? Because you memorize the common names. You're not officially responsible for the common names. That doesn't mean you shouldn't know them. Okay, sorry. Okay, your 1-methyl-ethyl we talked about is how to name that. But we've got our 1-methyl-ethyl that's located at position 2. I put it all together and I get 3,4-dichloro, 2,1-methyl-ethyl, butes, 2,ene,1-all. And I'm still wrong because what did I forget to do? Anybody see why I don't like nomenclature? I did all of that and I'm still bloody wrong. We literally just talked about it. E and Z. Is this a structure that shows cis-trans isomerism? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. How do we go through and do it? Number one, we identify that we have an alkene. That's super important. Then what we'll go through and do is identify each of the atoms connected to the alkene. And when I say that, people immediately start circling or drawing in now those red carbons. Those are not atoms connected to the alkene. What are those? They are the alkene. Okay? I want the things that are connected to it. So that would be carbon. Come on, pen. That would be a carbon up here. That would be a carbon in purple on the right. That would be a carbon in blue on the lower right. And then we'll do chlorine in green. Everybody see them? All right. I want to go through and assign priorities to each of those pieces. Okay. I can go through and do the RS system of labeling all four of those. That is allowed, but there's a shortcut here. The cis-trans all has to do with the rotation of that double bond. Okay? So I don't have to compare all four to each other. I just have to compare the correct two to each other. So what I will do is split the structure in half through the pi bond, perpendicular to the axis. And I will now compare priorities on each half. So on the left half, I'm comparing chlorine to carbon. Which one has the larger atomic mass? Chlorine. So my star is with my chlorine. I don't even have to assign a number. We just want a star. Go to the right half. Okay, the right half. I'm looking at carbon versus carbon. Is there a difference? No. So what do I do? 
I will move out to the next highest priority atom. The next highest priority atom above is carbon. The next highest priority atom below is which has a higher atomic mass? Oxygen. Which means the bottom one gets starred. Now what do I do with my stars? I will cut parallel to the double bond. Where are the stars? Same side of the line. Those we could call cis and we'd be again wrong. I have to say Z because they're on the same side. As long as it sticks in your head, I don't care. Okay. So just Z, 3, 4, dichloro. What is the Z applying to? The alkene. Where's the alkene? Position 2. 2Z, two 3, 4, dichloro, 2, 1, methyl, but 2, E, 1, all. Exciting, isn't it? Lower left, we have a heptene. I think it was seven. I didn't actually count it. I'm just going to trust it is. By definition, the ene is our higher priority functional group, so it is at position one. Again, this is one of those weird gray areas. We could imply that one. I would get in the habit of specifying it. Okay. Now the question comes is how do I number it? Okay. Do I go one, two, three? Or do I go one, two, three, Purple because? I want the substituent with lowest number possible, right? So purple is better than red. Everybody agree? Okay. How about blue? I can get the substituent even lower. The E is still at position one. The ene is lowest number for both. I have to move through the alkene. Blue is not valid because I'm not moving through the alkene in my numbering system. I've skipped the second atom. Okay? So blue is also wrong. So this should become 3-methyl hept-1-ene. Oh, what did I miss? The one is not necessarily required. I'd get in the habit of including it. Okay? The one case where it becomes problematic is, say, in an online homework system where you are required to enter the name correctly. Okay? Because we have dashes, we have spaces, we have commas, we have numbers, we have letters. Okay? Any mislocation of any of those pieces, and just like you experienced with mastering, if you used an online homework system, it's going to mark you as wrong because you shouldn't have a space there. Okay? Or you placed the letter in the wrong space. Okay? This is why, when it comes to nomenclature, I ask, I think, and I may have even gotten rid of it altogether, one question where you have to enter in the correct name. Every other option for nomenclature is multiple choice or drawing the structures. Okay? Because I find that insanely frustrating. Yes? The, which substituent is higher priority, the methyl or the alkene? The alkene takes higher priority than an alkene. So that's why we start with the alkene. You ready for the last one? We have a hex. We have a hex 2, 4, diene. I mean, I can put a di all the way in the middle of the name? Yes. Okay. That di, tri, whatever can show up wherever we want as long as it's directly applying to the functional group. Right? That includes the entire main chain, and I'd get hex 2, 4, diene. What is the problem with that name? Methyl. Am I missing a methyl? One, two, three, four, five, six. Should I start numbering where the five is at? One, two, three, why? Longest carbon chain. You will never have a methyl at position one. That makes no sense because if you include it in the main chain, 
it disappears. Okay? So the alkene does not start at position one. The only time it starts at position one is if you're in a cyclic structure. That's the only time. Okay. Okay? What is the part I'm missing now on this name? Z and E. So if we went through and took a look at this one, hopefully I did this one wrong, but we'll see. Ah, oh, it looks like I did it right. Okay. The double bond at position two. So same deal, I'll cut parallel. I'm comparing carbon to hydrogen, which is higher in, or sorry, I cut perpendicular first. So perpendicular, still carbon to hydrogen. Which is higher priority? Carbon. The other half, I'm comparing carbon to hydrogen, which is higher priority? Carbon. Carbon. Cut parallel. And they're on opposite sides. So the double bond at position two is trans, which means 2E. Oh, awesome. I think I did it wrong. We'll address the issue in a second. We do the other one perpendicular. Carbon to hydrogen. Carbon. The other side, carbon to hydrogen. Carbon, cut parallel. They're on the same side, that becomes Z, 4Z, hex 2,4-diene. Does anybody see any potential dilemmas coming out of this? And it may help if I erase all that work. Am I okay to erase? Yes. I would hope so, because it looks awful, but just in case. <coughs> Does anybody see any potential dilemmas? Could it be that if you start numbering on the right, one, two, three? If I change numbering, start it from right to left as opposed to left to right, would it still be hex 2-ene? Ah, hex 2-4-diene? Yes. Would it still be 2-e-4-z? No. Uh-oh. I've come up with two potential names with no way to differentiate. Yay, exciting. That's where our group of old people sat down and said, this is the way we do it. What is the way we do it? As a hint, remember I said I did it wrong? You will number so that Z gets the higher priority, which means the lower number. Okay. So I've actually done this one wrong. It should actually be flipped. It should be uh, 2Z4E. Okay. Before you freak out too much, okay. uh, well, almost. Are we good? Can I hit next? It's not the other molecule doesn't exist. The, this name is wrong. That's what happens. It's still the same molecule but that name is not the correct name. I can't agree with you more. Okay. I understand the reasoning behind it, but yeah, that name is wrong. So is it um, 2Z4E? Okay, so let's make sure we got the right answer up there. This one becomes 2Z4E. Okay, that is now the correct name. Are we okay with that, at least as well as we can be? Yeah. Try. I put this question up unintentionally, and that was a question a student asked. It was like, but what if you number it the other way? And I was like, well, but in the numbers, shit, no, you're right. I have no idea. So I went and dug it up. Rule 2.2.3. Okay. You're looking at sub, sub, sub levels okay, to get at the nuance between those. So what is the likelihood you would ever be tested on that? Slim to none. Okay. <laughs> Slim to none. Okay. It's only there because I wanted the diene in there, and then someone was smart enough to notice that I picked a structure that had issues with cis and trans. Okay. So, RS examples. <clears throat> You need to specify R and S for every single chiral atom. If you have a structure, a single structure with 20 chiral atoms, guess what you have to do? 20 different R and S assignments. Okay. Yes, that is insanely tedious. For the most part, 
Most tests center on probably asking two. Okay. Every so often you'll see three pop up. Why is it rarely asked to assign one? Multiple choice has four answers. If we only have one chiral atom, it's either R or S. It became a true false question. Okay. So we add at least a second one, which now scales the difficulty up because it can get all sorts of possible combinations. That's why you typically don't see more than that because now you're just being silly. Okay. So if we went through to take a look at these, come on, thank you. Chiral, 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 and chiral. So we have in this single slide two, four, six questions to go through and solve. Because we're limited on time, I'm going to pick one. We're going to do the lower left-hand corner. The rest, if you've got questions, you should feel free to ask. Okay? But it's the same set of rules. All right, so let's take a look at the lower left. I need to assign priorities. Uh, we might also do the lower right. Assign priorities to every atom of that chiral atom. Usually, the place that I will start is looking for hydrogen, because hydrogen, by default, is the lowest priority. So it is now four. I'm now comparing carbon to carbon to carbon. Is there a difference? Yes. I, yeah, I can distinguish them, but do they have a different atomic mass? No. Okay. Here's where I will cheat, and I can actually label the CH3. Because if I go out with the bottom carbon to the highest priority atom, I'm at carbon. The top one, carbon. But I'm going through a weird double bond. Don't stress about it yet. Yet. Okay. Go to carbon. CH3, hydrogen. So the CH3 is now 3. Okay. How do I distinguish between the top and the bottom carbons? Okay. Number of hydrogens is dangerous if we don't have hydrogens there. Right? And I don't mean we make it charged. I mean there's other substituents. So I don't like that rule. Right? We want to go based off of the priority of atoms connected to it. But when we go through and deal with chiral atoms, they're all sp3 hybridized. That doesn't work with the top one because it's double bond, it's sp2. So this was that weird rule in our list. If you have a double bond, you treat it as two bonds to carbon. So that top one, yes, is bonded to a carbon, but it is also bonded to a second carbon that is now a ghost. And it's still bonded to that hydrogen. Whereas the bottom one is bonded out to a carbon and two hydrogens. So when I go out to compare from my red ones, from my carbons, I go out blue carbon, purple carbon, no difference. I'll go out to the next highest priority for my atom, hydrogen, next highest, carbon. Top one has a higher priority than the bottom one, which means I can finish this out, one and two. Where did that carbon top come from? Where did the blue carbon floating on top come from? Yeah. Every time you have a double bond or a triple bond, you will treat the multiple bond as a phantom connection to whatever atom is out there. Okay. It's frustrating, but that's how you have to do it. It doesn't show up super often, but it does show up. Okay. There is kind of a cheat behind this. SP2, you will find, typically outranks SP3. SP will typically outrank SP2. Okay. So the lower hybridization, typically the higher the priority. It is typically because we can generate structures that it doesn't work. For instance, on this bottom one, if I made those hydrogens, CH3s, the bottom one is now higher priority. But that means I have to put a crap ton of carbons into my structure. So it becomes busier and then, again, kind of a, a bit silly to ask the question. Okay? The last part of this, and then we'll have to end, I apologize. Lowest priority must be aimed away from you, which means it must be dashed. Four, is it aimed away from me? Yes, so I'm looking at it the exact way I need to be. I will now start connecting an arc between 1 to 2 to 3. Which direction am I moving? 
counterclockwise, which means it's us. it's us. All of that and all I get is a letter. Yes. <laughs> Just like this class. All of the 16 <laughs> works and all you get is a letter. Okay.